We shall now turn to the chapter which we read together, Mark's Gospel, chapter 5, and we'll read again verse 2. Mark 5, verse 2, And when he, Jesus, was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. The first announcement of the Gospel is to be found in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. It's God's curse upon the serpent. And God said, I will put enmity between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. There would be enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, between Christ and the devil. And here we see a great example of it. Indeed, in the life of Christ from the very beginning, we see this confrontation. You remember shortly after he was born, how Satan stirs up Herod to kill all the little babies in Bethlehem in an effort to destroy the seed of the woman, the Messiah. Remember when Jesus began his public ministry <coughs> and he was baptized at the Jordan, how the Spirit drove him out into the wilderness to confront Satan. And for 40 days and 40 nights, he was tempted of the devil. But you remember, he said to Satan, Get thee behind me, Satan. In the very first chapter of Mark, we're told how Jesus went into the synagogue at Capernaum to preach the gospel. And there in the synagogue, there was a man possessed with an evil spirit. Devil-possessed man confronting him. We know who thou art. Art thou come to torment us before thy, our time? The spirit the spirit of Satan confronting Christ. You remember how Satan entered into Simon Peter when Jesus was telling Peter and the disciples how he must go to Calvary, how he must um, be handed over to the chief priests and elders, how he must be tortured and crucified. And Peter said, far be that from thee, Lord. We'll look after you. We'll fight for you. That won't happen. Get thee behind me, Satan. He says to Peter. Satan speaking through Peter, his disciple. Remember the great confrontation in the Garden of Gethsemane. Our Lord, almost overwhelmed by the cup of sufferings that was being presented to him. Abba, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. And again, with even greater earnestness, with thee all things are possible. Let this cup pass from me and his sweat as great drops of blood falling to the ground. But again, our Lord emerges from that temptation. The cup that the Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Of course I will. And so he goes to Calvary for the ultimate confrontation. When he and Satan, as it were, wrestle together. And eventually, through death, Christ got his heel on Satan's head and crushed it into the ground. Who through death 
destroyed him that had the power of death that is the devil Christ victorious well here we find one of these confrontations Jesus and his disciples cross the Sea of Galilee to the land of the Gadarenes part of Decapolis and there meets him coming out of the tombs a man possessed with a devil indeed with many devils a legion of them confrontation between Christ and Satan but Christ casts the devils out of this man and the story ends with a man clothed and in his right mind and sent out given a commission to be a missionary a preacher of the gospel go back to your own people and tell them how great things Christ has done for you what a mighty saviour we have and how we're to rejoice in him to praise and to worship him the son of God who came into this world to seek and to save the lost are you lost today are you saved have you found Christ has Christ found you have you got peace with God are you sure you're on the way to heaven there's only one saviour who can save you Jesus Christ look to him cry to him put your faith in him and he will save you well first of all today we have here an uncon unconverted man an unconverted man dominated by Satan many demons have taken possession of him he's an extreme case of an unconverted man yet in a sense it's true of us all in our unconverted state we were dominated by the devil servants of sin and Satan children of the devil that's what you are if you're unconverted a child of the devil ruled by Satan a slave of the wicked one totally depraved dead in trespasses and sins alienated and enemies in your minds to God by wicked works living in darkness and on the way to hell you and I were in Adam you remember when he was first created he was our representative we were in the covenant and when Adam was tempted we were tempted when Adam took that forbidden fruit we took it to Adam Satan said to Eve she said you shall not surely die <coughs> if you take this fruit you'll be like God knowing good and evil and she ate and she gave to Adam and you and I and Adam took that forbidden fruit to be like God and instead we became like the devil instead of being transformed into some superhuman being by taking the forbidden fruit we were all stamped with Satan's stamp children of the devil we trusted Satan rather than trust God we believed Satan's word against the divine word God said thou shalt not taste this fruit thou shalt not take it and eat it lest you die and the day that you eat of it you shall surely die 
we took it and we died spiritually. We believed Satan's words that God is unkind, harsh and cruel. And so we became the devil's children. And we're born into this world sinners. Before we're conceived in the womb, we're sinners. We sinned in Adam. And we're born with a sinful nature. And sin is natural and sin is easy. There's nothing easier than to sin. Nothing easier for the unconverted than to sin. Willing slaves of the prince of this world, the prince of darkness, hostile to God, thinking we're free. We can do what we like, but we're not really free. We just do what Satan tells us to do. And what Satan tells us will give us a thrill and make us feel good and enjoy ourselves. But all the time we are rebels. Rebels against God. Blindly, Satan leads us on, on the broad road that leads to destruction. Sometimes even in this life, that destruction has entered in. And we experience something of hell even here. And you see it around you, don't you? Maybe you've even experienced it yourself. We see those who are addicted to drink and to drugs, the misery of their lives. We see broken homes and broken marriages and miserable people. We see people ending up in prison because of sin. Well, here's this man here and he's a kind of an extreme case, really. The devil has taken possession of him in a terrible way. It must be awful to be devil-possessed. I don't think I've, had, I've met somebody myself whom I would be sure was devil-possessed, but I've heard from other people that they have. It's more common in certain countries where there's uh, lots of, as it were, um, magic, uh, playing around with evil spirits. In this country, Satan pretends that he doesn't exist. He's just a joke. He speaks with a soft, sweet voice so that people don't really realize that Satan is real. But in other places, parts of Africa and so on, he speaks as the roaring lion. And people are in fear, in fear of demons and fear of Satan. All playing around with evil spirits. Yes, and some drugs and certain music can lead to devil possession. What a terrible case we have here. This man, he couldn't live with other people. He couldn't bear to have clothes on. He tears his clothes off. He lives in the tombs among the dead. <coughs> death has, as it were, gripped him. He loves death. He loves darkness. People tried to bind him with chains, but he had supernatural strength, satanic strength that would break these chains. He couldn't be tamed. A wild man living in the tombs, a miserable life, cutting himself with stones, screaming out there in the graveyards. What a miserable picture. Hell is, as it were, come into his experience, even in this very life. An unconverted man. Now, you might not be in a desperate state like that. You might be quite a normal sounding person looking fine 
getting on okay, working, looking after your family, but if you're not a Christian, you're in the grip of Satan and you're on the way to a lost eternity. Repent and be converted. An unconverted man. Next we see here this man meets Jesus. Our Lord Jesus takes a boat with his disciples, crosses over the Sea of Galilee. He's concerned. Jesus had supernatural knowledge. He knew that there was one of his elect there in the land of the Gadarenes. He's concerned to go to save this man. Christ has a purpose in coming to Gadara. You would think that when the man possessed with the devils saw Jesus, he would flee away and hide. But instead, there's some supernatural power drawing him to Jesus. No man cometh unto me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. Strange how this man who hates people, who hates everybody, lives alone in the tombs. He feels drawn to Christ. God is working in him. He cannot run away. He's drawn in irresistibly to Christ. And when he comes, he falls down before Christ to worship him. Worshipping in the sense of posture more than anything else at this stage. And the devils which are in him cry out. They cry out, what have we to do with thee? Jesus, thou son of the most high God. Satan knows Christ. Satan believes everything that's in the Bible. The devils believe and tremble. What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. The devils know that they are on the way to hell. And that after a time of relative freedom, they will be cast into the pit to be tormented forever. I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. It's interesting how even Satan is under the command of God. Think of Job. How Satan came to God and asked permission to torment him. And how Satan was allowed to send robbers to take away his possessions, to send a great wind to destroy his uh, family. How Satan was allowed indeed to send sores and boils upon Job. Satan is allowed to go so far and no further because Satan can do nothing without God's command. What a comfort that is to us, that there is a supreme being, the Lord, our God, our Father in heaven, is almighty. And without his permission, Satan can do nothing. Satan in this man, the devils cry out, torment us not. Jesus asked him, what is thy name? And he says, legion, for we are many. A legion of devils had taken over this man. What a terrible situation he was in. A human being possessed by many, many devils. And the devils ask permission to enter into the swine. They can do nothing without permission. Christ is Lord. Satan is helpless without Christ. 
Christ's permission. We are to be dominated by faith, not fear. But then, thirdly, the devil's cast out. Seems to take place in two stages. First of all, Jesus says to the man, verse 8, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And the devils say, Can we enter into the swine? Don't banish us out of the country. Don't send us abroad. And Jesus allows the devils to enter into this great herd of swine that were feeding there. And the devils must obey. And they leave the man. Enter into this huge herd. 2,000 swine. And they run violently down a steep place into the sea. And are killed. Satan is destructive. Demons destroy. God is the creator. Satan is the destroyer. Why did Jesus allow the devils to enter into the swine, the pigs? Well, the Jews weren't to, were to regard pigs as unclean. Under Old Testament law, the ceremonial law, the pig was an unclean animal. They weren't to be eaten. They weren't to be kept for food. And here was where these men, and they had 2,000 pigs. They were dominated by the love of money. They were keeping these pigs in order to make profit from them. And Christ allows the devils to enter into these pigs. Did the devils trick Jesus? No. Jesus knew what would happen. He was fully aware and he allowed it because it was wrong for these Jews to have the pigs. They suffered because of their sin. Sin always brings suffering. They were motivated by the love of money and their money would perish with them. What happened to the devils after they entered into the pigs and the pigs were destroyed? Perhaps some of them came to Glasgow. There's certainly plenty of devil activity in Glasgow. Plenty of morality, plenty wickedness of every kind, plenty crime and violence, plenty sins, plenty hypocrisy, Satan is and his demons are very active in Glasgow. Maybe very active in your life. Beware of Satan, the subtle serpent, the roaring lion. He's always looking for somebody that he can destroy. Wickedness of every kind is practiced in our city and Satan is the father of lies and the father of immorality and the father of drunkenness and drug addiction and prostitution and homosexual immorality and all the rest of it. But Christ is stronger than Satan and Christ cast out the demons. Through Christ we are more than conquerors. Through our Lord Jesus we gain victory over the powers of darkness. It's interesting to think too that devils are very old. They don't die like you and me. They've been around since creation. Thousands of years old. And they're learning all the time. How many wiles there are of the devil. How clever they are at tempting. Don't argue with Satan. 
Say to Satan what Christ said, Get thee behind me, Satan. Try arguing with Satan, with demons, and they'll always win. Get thee hence, Satan. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. It is written, the word of God is the sword of the Spirit for chasing away the devil. God saves, and therefore I won't do what you say, Satan. So the devils are cast out. And then, fourthly, we see here a new man. What a change has taken place. The keepers of the swine fled. They went into the town to tell the people in the town and the area round about what had happened. And crowds came out to see Jesus. And they see a man clothed and in his right mind sitting beside Jesus. Where did the clothes come from? Well, maybe, maybe Jesus performed another miracle and clothed the man. But we're not told that he performed a miracle in creating clothes, so very likely it was some spare clothes that the disciples had and that they gave to this man to clothe his nakedness. Jesus heals him. The man is in his right mind. The demons made him mad. But now he's healed. His brain is right. He's brought to a stage of sanity. He's now an ordinary loving human being. Restored from the state he was in. And when the people from the town see the man healed, they're so glad and they say to Jesus, stay with us. You've done a wonderful thing. Oh no, they don't say that. All they can see is the, the dead pigs. And all they can think about is the financial loss. Go away, Jesus. We don't want you. We prefer money. 2,000 pigs, what would that cost today? Maybe half a million pounds. An awful lot of money. What is money in comparison to one person saved? One person saved is worth half a million, a million, a thousand million pounds. Yes, indeed. You can't put value on it eternal blessings coming to this poor miserable individual who lived in the tombs but this these people they were like the rich young ruler who came to Jesus you remember he came and he said what good thing shall I do to inherit eternal life Jesus said keep the commandments oh he said I've kept all these from my youth up well, said Jesus, I'll tell you what to do. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor. Come and follow me and you shall have treasure in heaven. And the man went away sad because he was very rich. And he loved his riches more than he loved his soul. He wouldn't give up his money because it was his God. And these people who kept the pigs, their money and their pigs were their God. They didn't care for the poor man who was suffering. Didn't care for his situation. They wanted rid of Jesus. They saw him as a threat. All they could see was the financial loss. And no doubt too, their conscience was bothering them. These Jews keeping pigs. What were they doing keeping pigs? Unclean animals. But the man, he's healed. Jesus doesn't force himself upon the gatherings. He goes back to the boat. And the man prays him, pleads with him that he be allowed to come with Jesus. He's fallen in love with Christ. He wants to be with Jesus from now on. Have you fallen in love with Christ? Giving your heart to him. 
Is he your beloved? Do you delight in Jesus? He wants to be with Jesus, but Jesus says no. He sends him back. Return and tell, tell your fellow citizens, tell your relatives what great things the Lord has done for you. Go and be a missionary. And the man went and he told the people, began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him. And all men did marvel. A mighty missionary. We think of the woman of Samaria, that immoral woman. She met Jesus. She was converted. And she went back to her own people and she said, Come see a man who told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Messiah, the Christ? Come and see Christ. So what about you? Have you been saved? Have you told others what great things God has done for you? You know, it's not just our duty to believe in Jesus as our Savior. It's also our duty to tell others how he saved us. Once I was darkness, now I'm light. Once I was on the broad road to hell, now I'm on the way to heaven. Once I was lost, but now I'm found. Once I was dead, but now I'm alive. The Lord Jesus saved me. Have you told people about your salvation? What must I do to be saved? You're to believe in your heart and you're to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, for with a heart man believeth unto righteousness, sins forgiven, and with a mouth confession is made unto salvation, to the full enjoyment of salvation. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed of Christ. Stand for him, for his cause and his kingdom. Tell others what great things Christ has done for you. And seek the salvation of your family, your friends, your neighbours, your city, your nation, your generation. Here's a man, at one time possessed with a legion of devils, living in the tombs. He couldn't be tamed smashing chains and pieces when they tried to bind him and now clothed and in his right mind going round telling how Jesus saved him let's pray